Welcome to Independent Sources. I'm Viano Ravinka. And I'm Gary Pierre Pierre. Ever since Israeli commandos stormed the Gaza flotilla, Israel has come under harsh criticism for much of the international community. However, the United States has remained relatively quiet throughout the ordeal. The incident has some asking whether Israel hardline is depleting some of the U.S. international political currency. On this edition of Independent Sources, we examine the possible effects of what some have called the United States' blind support of Israel. We try to figure out if the most popular sport in the world can find its footing in America. Then how one man is using the World Cup to talk about the issue of violence against women in war-torn countries. And we hear how Vodou practitioners are trying to cast their once dark faith in a new light. We'll have those stories and news of the week when we come back. I think independent media often has a more narrow focus, or at least has more contact with the subject and more experience. And while that experience may come out in sort of nuanced, opinionated media, it's at least getting those stories out there that otherwise wouldn't be told. International ire over the Gaza flotilla attack is still high, as Israel seems hard-pressed to admit any wrongdoing after the incident. Just this weekend, Israel's ambassador to Washington said his country would reject an international inquiry into last week's raid. Some critics believe Israel is being emboldened by the U.S. muted response on the matter. This has prompted suggestions that the United States may be losing international allies as it continues to support Israel's hard line. With me to discuss these issues are Adam Dichter of the Jewish Week newspaper and Baruch College political science professor Dr. Dov Waxman. Thank you both for being here. Thank you for having me. Let's talk about uh, the relations between the U.S. and Israel. Um, are we seeing an unwavering support on the part of U.S. to Israel, Adam? I think so far the administration has been very um, reluctant to criticize because the facts are not completely out yet. I think the investigation is ongoing. Israel is investigating. Uh, I think the facts that have come out so far are that Israel was enforcing a blockade, which was agreed upon under the Oslo Accords in 1993 between the Palestinians and Israelis, enforcing the, uh, the zone of the sea zone uh, coming into Israel and during that time uh, there were eight ships seven of the ships were intercepted peacefully on one ship uh, unfortunately it was a violent reaction by the crew there's been video released that showed a violent reaction by the people on that ship they were anticipating the Israelis ambush them and attack them so I think when people look at the facts it is hard to criticize that enforceable that enforcement action uh, and the administration, I think, so far has been uh, supportive of letting all the facts come out. But generally speaking, um, has the U.S. Uh, government, uh, this one and the ones in the past, been providing unwavering support to Israel? Is that perception I wouldn't say accurate? unwavering. I think that there was, there was, particularly in this administration, has been a rough patch that happened uh, not so long ago when the Israelis uh, announced uh, housing uh, project in East Jerusalem at the time when the vice president was there. I think they took exception to that quite vocally. I think since then there's been a lot of uh, talks back and forth between the Israelis and, and uh, the Americans. Uh, I do think this is a more even-handed approach in this administration to the Israeli-Palestinian peace process than under the previous administration. But I think that always the approach of any administration should be let the facts come out in an incident like this. And I think the facts are clearly on Israel's side. No. Well, I, w I would agree that, uh, by and large, the administration's response has been supportive of Israel, but I, I wouldn't quite characterize it as unwavering, and I think it's certainly not been full-throated in its support. I think the contrast with uh, its predecessor, the Bush administration, is quite clear. The Bush administration uh, very immediately and very vocally would come to Israel's aid regardless, and I think this administration has been much measured and more cautious in its, in its support for Israel. So while it has um, uh, basically backed Israel, at least, in, in the United Nations in, in preventing a more critical Security Council resolution and it seems to at least at the moment support Israel's refusal to allow an international investigation of the incident. I think uh, uh, at least President Obama himself has also spoken of the need to, uh, to deal with the suffering of Palestinians in Gaza to uh, alleviate if not end the blockade um, and I think other spokespeople uh, within the administration off the record have also been somewhat critical in their remarks. So I, I think whilst uh, generally being supportive, I, I do think there is a, a, a subtle difference in the, in the tone and the, the, the strength of the support that the administration has offered Israel. I think numerous members of uh, the government, members of Congress, 
have actually gone down to see the situation firsthand uh, on the border of Gaza and southern Israel and experience what happens there, a uh, num number of, of uh, missiles and rockets that go soaring over the border. I experienced it personally in, in uh, 2007. Uh, the southern towns that are con consistently under rocket attack from Gaza. People who see that firsthand, there have been American officials who have been there at the time, seen, uh, have had to go into bomb shelters. And once you see that, I think you could be very supportive of the idea that what comes into Gaza uh, should be carefully monitored to make sure that there aren't further uh, explosives, ordinances brought in to, that could cause more harm to Israelis. Well, I, I think I, I think there's 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 two issues, and that and I think these uh, are are separate and need to be uh, distinguished. And and this is becoming increasingly apparent. One is the need for Israel, uh, or for there to be some sort of monitoring of what of uh, imports into Gaza to prevent uh, Hamas's rearmament and and to prevent particularly to prevent it from acquiring the rockets uh, that can threaten Israeli uh, civilians. But I think that issue is, is, is somewhat separate from the broader issue of maintaining the blockade uh, three years old now on, on Gaza. And I think the administration, in its comments, has actually uh, made that, that important distinction, that while Israel has a right to ensure the safety of its citizens in southern Israel, uh, enforcing a blockade may actually be uh, counterproductive. To but just end. to be clear, it is a blockade by the Egyptians and the Israelis, who both agree that it's in their mutual interest to make sure these arms don't come into the Hamas. Egyptians have and again, as the, at 1993, the uh, Palestinians and Israelis did agree that Israel has the right to do that. It's, it's been codified in the Oslo Accords. Let's uh, talk more about uh, um, what U.S. is doing for Israel and the reasons behind its support. Uh, Dov, you wrote about it and you said that it's not just the lobbyists uh, in Congress uh, dictating the foreign policy. Talk more about the other reasons for which uh, you. US is supporting Israel. Well, I think, you know, for one thing, there is um, overwhelmingly uh, American public support, long standing public support within the American public, based upon numerous factors a sympathy for Israel, a perception uh, that Israel has um, suffered a great deal in the course of this conflict. Um, as well as the belief that Israel is a, is a democratic country that shares common values with Israel. So I think American public opinion um, has, been, has been overwhelmingly supportive of Israel. I think that in, in times past, and possibly still to this day, um, there's also been a belief that Israel provides some strategic benefits for the United States. But I think that question, that issue in particular, the strategic benefits uh, to the United States of its, of its support for Israel is more in question today than it's ever been. Adam, does this affect uh, U.S. capital in, in, in the world, U.S. standing in the world? Well, I'm sure that there are portions of the world, governments in the world, that would like to see America dissolve all ties to Israel. It's not going to happen because, as uh, Dov said, uh, it is in our strategic interest to have a stable democracy as a partner in that region. Uh, the other the surrounding governments are not as, as stable, or not stable at all, some of them. And uh, I think that if, there, if it really was against America's interests, I don't think that it, no matter how much electoral power supporters of Israel may have in terms of uh, their, the fundraising, in terms of their activism, if it was really against America's interests, I really don't think you'd see as, as much of Congress be supportive or the, or the American administrations act against America's interests. Well, I, I would just say on that that I, I do think that um, there's an important distinction between Congress's support. A lot of Congress people who support Israel do so uh, for, for, many, for a variety of reasons, and I, and I and I don't necessarily think it's purely out of on the basis of, of their sense of American strategic interests. But um, the, the issue of American support for Israel shouldn't be kind of construed as either or. Either America backs Israel or it abandons Israel. The question is the degree to which America supports Israel, how close. Today, the United States really stands apart as, as almost being Israel's sole supporter in the international community, at least over this, uh, this, this, this incident in, in, uh, with regards to Gaza. And I think many people are questioning whether that serves America's interests to be seen to be the sole backer of particularly this government. The issue isn't even supporting the state of Israel, it's supporting the Netanyahu government and its policies. And I think there is a real debate underway in Washington to debate today. And part of what fuels that debate is the impression that the Netanyahu government isn't sensitive to America's interests and needs. And so any alliance has to be give and take, has to be both sides. Israel uh, responding to America's concerns and the United States responding to Israel's concerns. Well, at the end of the day, there's a, there's a difference in, in the way they, they look at the situation. America has strategic interests, but doesn't see its existence threatened the way Israel does. And, and the uh, way that Israel has to go about making its policy decisions, almost unlike anywhere else in the world, the decisions are a matter of life and death in many situations. But that, so, you wouldn't, you would agree that that doesn't mean the, that Israel should disregard American interests. Uh, I believe that the first and foremost priority has to be staying alive and protecting the security of their own country and uh, maintaining and the alliance. I with believe the that 
States. throughout the, the 60 years of Israel existence, the, those two goals have been have been mutually inclusive. But maintaining American support is Israel's mm -hmm. st uh, strategic interest. It certainly is. And on this note, uh, we're going to have to close this spirited discussion. We'll be sure to continue it. And uh, we thank you again for coming in studio. Dr. Dov Waxman and Adam Victor, thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Now here's Abby Ushola with some other news. Thanks, Vianora. Here's a look at some headlines from the ethnic media. Brooklyn residents and community activists are outraged after racist posters were plastered in Bed-Stuy, Brownsville, and other areas. The Amsterdam News reports that the posters feature a white man hanging a black man from a tree with a noose around his neck. The police filed the incident as a hate crime. The Pakistani Post reports that since Faisal Shahzad's failed bombing attempt in Times Square, many Pakistani Americans have been interrogated at U.S. airports for up to six hours upon their return. Some Pakistani students who've applied to study in the U.S. are now foregoing their visa applications to pursue universities in Britain, Australia, Canada, and the United Arab Emirates. The Washington Informer reports that the gap between the average net worth of African Americans and whites has quadrupled in the past 23 years. A new study conducted by Brandeis University's Institute on Assets and Social Policy finds that the average white family has acquired $95,000 more wealth than the average black family. And finally, from Caribbean Life, Senator Malcolm A. Smith of Queens and Senator Eric Adams of Brooklyn have placed ads on buses and billboards in their boroughs asking young men to stop letting their pants sag. Adams says the sagging pants culture is an immature disregard for basic civility, courtesy, and responsibility. Those are just a few headlines from the ethnic media. Back to you, Gary. Thanks, Abby. In just a couple of days, the biggest sporting event on the planet will get underway in South Africa. It's estimated that over 715 million people will be watching the World Cup. So why has this sport known as football, football, and soccer not transcended the pitch in the U.S. as it has in other countries? With me to discuss the issue are Jean-Combe de la Loi of France Amérique, Roberto Lima of the Brazilian Voice, and joining us from South Africa via Skype is Fulbright scholar and author Dr. Peter Alegi. Welcome. Dr. Alegi, let's start with you. Tell me, what's the mood like in South Africa a couple of days before the uh, World Cup? Uh, the mood is very, very enthusiastic. The excitement has built uh, over the past few weeks steadily. And of course, Bafana Bafana, the South African national team, is playing in the first match against Mexico. So the people are very much uh, behind the national team, and uh, we're just about ready for the feast to begin. Soccer is mo much more than uh, sport in most of the world. Uh, some would say it's, it's a religion. Roberto, why is soccer so important in people's lives? Uh, I don't know. I'm, you know, growing up in Brazil, you know, before you, you say your dad's name, you ask for a ball. It's, a, it's, a, it's part of our culture, you know, in, in my country. And uh, we love soccer more than anything in the world, for sure. Jaco? Yeah, with that, it's a question of identity. You know, like uh, when you grow up, like you, you support and play for your local team, and you, you go, you play through the leagues, and and it's just something you know, like one day you wish to play. You know, and so, and, and soccer or, or football, uh, like we say in in France and Switzerland, and it's it's yeah, it's it's something very important in the life of kids. And uh, when you you get to uh, grown-up age like I am, you're still like a kid. You still love the, the, your, your games you, and you, you know, like uh, everybody in my, my family is going to wake up and for, to see the games, like my four-year-old son, and it, it, it goes on like this, you know. Dr. Allegri, why is football, football, so important in people's lives? Well, I think uh, the other two guests uh, said it very nicely. Um, I think uh, soccer speaks to people in a way that other sports don't. Uh, I know this is almost heretical in the United States, uh, but it's maybe the simplicity of, of football, but also the odd fact that it's played with our feet rather than with our hands, which seems to be quite more natural, right? Um, look at basketball, look at American football. And at the same time, you know, the rules are, have been standardized for 150 years almost. So everybody around the world plays the same game. 
And uh, yeah, it's inexpensive and it's got a rhythm that uh, really few other games have. It's got room for individual skill and creativity within a team structure and context. So it's got all of these great all of these great qualities that, that make it really magical. Now, beyond the game itself, though, I mean, there's a, there's a passion that, you know, most Americans just don't understand why uh, people around the world are so crazy about the sports. I mean, talk about the social aspect of the game. Why is it so, so galvanizing of, a, of an event, of, Bra of, of a thing? In Brazil, every little kid, you know, dreams about being a, a big football star, you know, when they grow up. It's like a way of... Um, getting out of their lives, you know, out of poverty and become somebody important, you know. Besides being a, 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 f a fun game to play, um, I don't know in, in, in the United States why football never became uh, uh, a fever like it is in the other parts of the world. I, I think there is a few uh, different aspects on this. Not being too American, not being an American game, being one. And I don't think the other big leagues would like to have the competition or, you know, of the, the most popular sports in the world, you know, uh, competing for, for the money that is already being spread out, you know, among the big leagues here. I mean, Roberto, you just took us to why football, soccer is not as popular uh, in this country. Uh, do you think it will ever be very popular like it is in France, for instance, jean -Combe? It has potential. I mean, look at New York, they have a new stadium, there is room for growth, you know. The only problem is, like, my four-year-old son, you know, he's, he started playing soccer last year. He's playing a little team, but there is no team in New York, like, where you can grow, with which you can grow up, you know. Like, uh, the Red Bulls is just a franchise, and you just get there when you're grown up. If you had the, the Brooklyn Sock FC or something, and every year, you know, you, you hope to get one year, like, to, to improve, and then, then you have the chance to get to the big league. That would change a lot because you have a lot of kids playing soccer in the U.S. Do you think your uh, fellow uh, countryman Thierry Henry's potential arrival to the Red Bulls will change this, uh, soccer here? It could. It could. Uh, well, I'm not. I'm not. Sure, I'm not sure if Thierry Henry is going to sign in the end because he might end up, you know, in in England or something. But all these big names can draw people. Like for the first time, I'm considering going to see the games in in New York because there's a stadium there. Dr. Leggi, do you think? soccer would ever transcend the pitch here in the United States, and why? Well, I think in some ways it already has. The problem is that the United States is such a huge country that, you know, you, you don't see those local passions come out in the mainstream so much. Um, for example, one of the strongest traditions of football or soccer in the United States is with the immigrant populations, and whether this is Italians or uh, uh, Balkans or Brazilians or, or, you know, Jamaican or whatever you want to put in there. There's been a long, long tradition dating back to the late 19th century of very, very strong local immigrant leagues in the United States. But because they are local immigrant leagues, they don't get the kind of exposure uh, and they don't reach the level of popularity um, that we associate with the mainstream sports in the United States. The second factor, I think, has to do with the more recent changes in soccer in the United States, and that is that the sort of uh, white, mostly white suburbs uh, have become soccer crazy. And the, the, these two realities, the reality of the immigrant soccer experience and the reality of the suburbs don't really connect very well. And until in the United States you see those two realities coming together, um, it's going to be a problem to reach the level of, say, Major League Baseball or the NFL or the NBA. Roberto, uh, the U.S. Um, 20 years ago was a pushover. Now it's it's very strong competitor. Do you think the success of the national team will increase uh, visibility of soccer. That's for sure. You know, one of the reasons you know the, the sports never became a huge success in this country was the lack of of uh, uh, championship caliber teams. You know, and uh, I think that's one of the reasons American people haven't fallen in love with uh, with football yet. Well, one last question. Uh, I'm going to put you on the hot seat here, uh, Dr. Leggi. Who's going to win this this World Cup? Well, I'm a historian, so I'm not <laughs> supposed to predict the future. Uh, that's the job of the economists. But uh, I'll play an economist and get it wrong. I'll say Spain. Okay, we got one for Spain. Jacob? I'll go with my wife's team, Brazil. 
I'm not a psychic, but um, I don't think Brazil is the favorite to win this year. Of course, I have the hope of becoming champion again, but I think Argentina is going to be the, the world champion. Well, I don't care. Brazil is going to win. Even if they don't win, they win to me. And it's going to be excommunicated <laughs> in Brazil for saying Argentina is going to win. Unfortunately, we have to live with that. <laughs> Peter Leggi, Roberto Lima, and Jean-Claude de la Loire, thanks for joining us. Pleasure. Thank you for having me. We'll be right back. With the World Cup just days away, South Africa is also playing host to an initiative that seeks to address a worldwide problem, violence against women. Young people from around the world are expected to arrive in Johannesburg to devise strategies to address the crisis in what is being called the Men Up campaign. Michelle Garcia has more. For a long time, most of my life, I, I thought I was a good guy because I never raped a woman. I never hit or battered a woman, and just because I didn't do certain things, it makes me a good guy. The good guy stands up. The good guy is not a bystander. For journalist Jimmy Briggs, taking that step was Man Up, a youth-targeted campaign he co-founded two years ago to recruit boys and men to help end violence against women and girls. We're redefining the phrase Man Up. Um, at, at first glance, it's, it's a phrase that, that one might think was directed towards men, and it is, but it's also a phrase that's inspired by hip-hop and urban culture to represent, to not back down. It will begin at the World Cup in South Africa with a gathering of some 200 young people from 50 countries. My name is Lavera Conto, and I'm a man up dedicated from Liberia. Hi, I'm Claudia. And I'm Steven, and we're from Honduras. Delegates are expected to receive training in video production, fundraising, and public speaking skills they will use to tackle the crisis back home. My name is Luis Kasindi Kilongo, a man up delegate from the Democratic Republic of Congo. You know, in my community, women are the primary victims of all the worst effects of the different wars we've had since 1998. When I was covering wars, I didn't see violence against women as its own conflict. To be frank with you, I saw it as one of the things that happens in war. I mean, I didn't see it as, as its own distinct phenomenon. And it is, to be sure. I learned this as a journalist, but, but hearing the voices of the young people who, who applied and who were successful in becoming a part of the campaign, that message was made clear. On a daily basis, our mothers and sisters continue to be raped and violated by armed forces on Congolese soil. The crisis of violence against women has been taken up by women's advocacy groups, the United Nations, and celebrities. Long-time advocates say more is needed. But it is so critical for men who speak the language, who came from that culture to come up and, and own the situation and say, we can change, this is not our destiny. Hi, my name is Franklin Kobe, a Nigerian delegate. But I believe if you protect a woman, you protect a nation. It would be interesting for any male leader um, who is interested in these issues to make sure that they maintain sort of gender-based perspective in their work, that they do have uh, women who have experience in gender-based violence and discrimination. Youth delegates had to partner with local groups to carry out their campaigns. Man Up has promised seed money, mainly from private donors and foundations. So I knew all along that if it happened, it was going to happen at the wire, and that's where we are. This massive effort has meant many meetings and much traveling, and precious little time with Mariela, his daughter. At the end of the day, it comes down to me wanting to create something better for my daughter. That's my legacy. In a very personal way, Man Up is sort of uh, my redemption. It's an opportunity for me, again, personally, to become the man that I, that I think I could be one day, maybe. For Independent Sources, I'm Michelle Garcia. And finally, from us tonight, part three of our Keep the Faith series. For years, Haitian voodoo has been viewed as dark and evil in the Western world.
practitioners of the faith are even stigmatized in Haiti and other African nations. Some followers are now working to shed these labels and cast their faith in a new light. Abby Ishola filed this report. These voodoo followers are paying homage to the dead at this ceremony in a Brooklyn basement. Among the honorees are their Haitian ancestors who were the first disciples of the mystical faith. The religion has remained relatively underground since many associate it with witchcraft and devil worship. In Haiti, voodoo is largely seen as the religion for the uneducated. And the collier that we use in our initiations. But times are changing, and many believers are now openly proclaiming their roles in the religion. I'm Florence Jean Joseph. I'm a member of so great, like it's the highest... Uh, the highest uh, type of initiation you can receive in Voodoo. While growing up in Haiti, she was a strict Catholic who entered a convent in hopes of becoming a nun. But something was missing. Jean Joseph says her spiritual path eventually took a detour when she moved to New York in 1980 and attended a conference on Voodoo. That was where she first connected to the faith. In Voodoo, this is like... Uh, it's like ecstasy. This is where like, you can really uh, excel in being a divine person and work toward perfection. It's this connection to the faith that put Jean Joseph and other practitioners on a journey to help bring voodoo out of the darkness. Now it's like we're trying to open schools to teach, uh, to teach the future generation about the witch culture because voodoo extends the heritage extends beyond its borders. But to many Christians like Bishop Guy Sanserit, regional Roman Catholic Bishop of Brooklyn, voodoo has no place in the modern world. I think that every Haitian should quickly, uh, possibly keep uh, the color, uh, the, uh, some of the dances and the music and the painting that may the art, the arts that might have been born around this phenomena, but uh, the theology or the belief, I think, is totally a thing of the past, and we have to move on. Some critics have gone as far as blaming voodoo for the recent earthquake in Haiti. Christian televangelist Pat Robertson claimed that a pact made with the devil during France's rule in the country led to the disaster. His statement opened old wounds in Haiti. Practitioners were reportedly attacked and food was kept from them. Jean Joseph says voodoo is not devil worship. When uh, voodoo came to Haiti, of course, like they were into... Like, it was like a religion, like a need to liberate ones from mental, psychological, and environmental slavery. And Haitian voodoo was born then. Why did you smile just now? I mean, like, it's so beautiful. It's a beautiful thing that helped me really uh, grow and really helped me understand others. Once I hear all the negative things being said about voodoo, I said, if only they know. For independent sources, Abby Ishola. That's our show. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you again next week. In the meantime, be independent minded.